Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate your interest. And I'll tell you a little bit about our program. Uh, I guess you all got all your letters saying this is fight crime and investing kids and you know all that. Have you all ever heard of that before? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of it. If not, okay, super. I've been doing this since I was elected 19 years ago. So I signed up with this program 19 years ago and have been involved in it ever since and uh, it's a great program. But anyway, I'll introduce myself. I'm Oldham County Sheriff Steve Sparrow. And uh, Fight Crime Investing Kids has called upon me several times to put on programs. This is the first time they've asked me to host one. But uh, I've been to D.C. and spoken on behalf of the agency on several occasions. And uh, it's just something I really believe in and our children. One of the things that I dearly believe in is three things. Our children, our elderly and domestic violence victims. Those are my three passions, and this just happens to be one of the, the passions that I'm here for today is the children. So, um, you all will have to bear with me, and we got another keynote speaker here today. I'll introduce him to you shortly. But, uh, <coughs> the goals of this event here today is, I wanna read this to you, because I can't remember all the stuff that they sent me. I am not a one of those photographic memory kind of guys. So the purpose of the clergy, cops, kids, and community is to convey that law enforcement leaders are convinced that high quality programs like home visiting, preschool for those children birth to age five, out of school time programs for children and youth and programs to help troubled youth get back on track and to prevent crime additionally to promote these investments, credible voices are needed across sectors, including those of faith-based leaders, to number one, raise public awareness of the value of high-quality preschool, home visiting, child care, and out-of-school time programs, and programs to get troubled youth back on track, to educate state and federal lawmakers on the values of these high-quality proven programs, and to urge them to increase investments so that programs reach all children, to gain long-term support for increased state, federal investments for these high quality programs. <coughs> Excuse me, and our main message for the event is the research shows that high quality early childhood, childhood care and education programs give kids the capacity to do well in school and reduces the chance that they will grow up to be criminals. Parent coaching programs called home visiting nationally can prevent child abuse and neglect by 50%. Now, I would like to introduce at this time to you our keynote speaker, and his name is Tom Pierce. Are you ready, Tom? Yes, sir. All right. Tom recently served as a state representative for the 73rd District, serving the three terms allowed by the state of Michigan. While serving in the state house, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Pierce led several faith-based initiatives in Lansing. Pierce also served in his final term as the dean of his caucus, giving him the responsibility of mentorship of the newly elected members. During his tenure, he held several leadership roles focusing on policies affecting children and their families. Prior to serving in the legislature, Pierce held leadership positions in several parachurch organizations, including North Kent Service Center, serving struggling families in rural northern Kent County and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, let's see. So, let's see, he, okay, here we go. He's also served both in full and part-time roles as part of the ministerial staff of several churches. Most recently, Pierce served as the consultant and board member to multiple area nonprofits. Mr. Pierce has been recognized with several awards and accomplishments, Guardian of Small Business Award, Legislator of the Year, After School Champion Award, Michigan's Child Heroes Award, Literacy Advocate Award, and Fight Crime Invest in Kids Michigan's Crime Fighter Award. Mr. Price is a graduate of Cornerstone University in Grand Rapids with a BA in Communications. He and his wife Janet have been married for 34 years and have two children and three grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Tom Pierce, your keynote speaker today.
Thank you. Uh, Sheriff Sparrow gave me a near impossible task. He's asked me to be brief and clear. And being a fam former pastor, I've seldom been brief in my life. And once I became a politician, I was no longer allowed to be clear. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. First, I think, l let's, let's pray. Would you allow me to do that? Father, we thank you for this community. We thank you for its sheriff. We pray a hedge of protection over the law enforcement in this community. Um, may they be able to do their duties safely. May they be able to uh, keep this community safe. And may we as uh, individuals who benefit from that, uh, may we hold them in high esteem and pray for them on a regular basis that they may be able to do the duties we've asked them to do uh, effectively and with a heart that makes sure the community knows that there is a love between law enforcement and its community. Thank you for this opportunity. I pray and uh, ask you to bless each pastor or ministerial leader uh, here today. Uh, may this meeting be beneficial for everyone. We ask this in your name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to apologize. I'm a storyteller, so I'm going to start this with a story. If you want to use it, you take it and make it your own. I, I give you full permission to do anything like that. It's an ancient fable that I've thrown myself into to give it a modern twist, and the cameraman's already telling me to not move around. So, uh, you know, if you see me shifting, just, just nudge me that, that other direction. I had the privilege of working on the Sioux Reservation in South Dakota during my high school uh, years. It was with a missionary that was there uh, serving the Indian community on the reservation. And my first year doing this, the first job I was given was to go out onto the reservation and pick up a widow to bring her to one of the church activities. So the missionary drew out a map on how to get from the church out to the, uh, the widow's home and, uh, and threw me the keys to his car and I am on my way, and life couldn't be better. A 16-year-old driving somebody else's car on a reservation. I mean, how good can that, how, how great is that? Until nothing on the map looks like anything where I'm driving. And I am lost on an Indian reservation driving somebody else's car at 16 years old. <coughs> And I see a few of you that are near my age. Uh, this was obviously before cell phones. It was before pagers. It was before GPS. I was out there on my own. And I'm driving along trying to figure out what in the world I'm going to do. And I see an elderly Indian gentleman sitting under the shade of, the tr of a tree about 50 yards off the road. So I quick stopped the car jump out, stand at the driver's side, and yell over to the gentleman, Sir, could you please tell me where I am? And he looked out at me and he said, Yes, I can. You're over there. <laughs> now, I took that that I was being rude and that I needed to go over to talk to him. So I grabbed the map. I ran over to him. I apologized for yelling from the car. I handed them, him the map and I said, Could you please tell me where I am? And now he's got a little smile on his face, and he says, yes, now you're over here. <laughs> so now I know he's just playing with me. But he looks at the map, and just like me, he can't make heads or tails out of it. But being much wiser than I was at 16 years old, he said, listen, I lived on the reservation most of my life. I know everyone, or pretty much everyone. If you just tell me the name of the woman you're going to pick up, I can probably draw you a better map. And it's at that moment that I know the missionary told me her name. But I didn't write it down. And I can't, for the life of me, remember it. So I thank him for his time. I take the map back and I start walking back to my borrowed vehicle. And he calls out to me and he says, son, where are you going? Now, if I'd have been wise enough or witty enough, I should have said, I'm going over there. But I, 
I didn't have that. I just looked back at him and said, sir, to be perfectly honest, I have no idea. And then he asked me one of the most profound questions that could ever be asked. Well, son, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to know when you get there? If you don't know where you're going, how are you going to know when you get there? One of the things I've learned in my life, both in public policy work and in the church and in parachurch ministry, is that if you don't have a road map and you don't have a specific destination in mind, you can spend an awful lot of time spinning your wheels and not really getting done what I believe God has asked each and every one of us to do. And one of the reasons I love being a part of the leadership of an, an organization called Shepherding the Next Generation is we have a defined destination. And we have an incredible roadmap that not only is a good roadmap because it's all written out and it's clear and everyone knows exactly where they're heading when they're looking at it, but it's also proven strategically to work. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. So let me tell you what Shepherding the Next Generation. I want to calm any fears right away to tell you that it is a free membership organization made up of evangelical pastors and ministry leaders. I hope you heard the word free, because I mean it. There is absolutely no cost to you, to your church. Uh, we are not looking for any dollars coming from you to us. What we are looking for are people who are willing to give a little of their time, share their voice or use their voice on behalf of what we try to do, and help us with new ideas on how we can do it better. To even define the roadmap even that much further. Here's what we do. We have one focus. Much like Sheriff Sparrow talked about, the focus is children growing up in poverty here in the United States. And what can we do to change the trajectory of their life so that they will no longer have to be trapped in the cycle of poverty? That is it. That's our mission. That's our focus. How we do it becomes the roadmap that we'll talk about here in a minute. But we have actually two roadmaps that shepherding works on that's just a little bit different than fight crime and our law enforcement members <coughs> within that organization. The first track is we try to be an incubator of ideas, a motivator of the faith community, and a linker of organizations on how the church can be a bigger part of the solution when it comes to children in poverty. I want to get philosophical with you for a minute. And to do that, I've got to give you a quick backstory. And here it is. If you look at education in the United States, education began in the church. Sunday school originally wasn't to teach Bible stories. Sunday school was to teach children how to read and write so they could read the Bible themselves. It wasn't until the late 1800s that government decided that Schools ought to be provided through the public uh, domain, and it wasn't until the early 1900s that we were really having public schools almost everywhere in the country. You know, there were, there were examples of, you know, places up in the Appalachians or out in New Mexico where they didn't have them, but for the most part, they were at capacity. The church's response during that time period was one of two things. They either said, go ahead, you can teach the masses, we'll change Sunday school to do something else. The other option was, you can teach the masses, but you're not teaching our children. And that was the beginning of the parochial school system, where in many parts of the country, um, the private faith-based schools began to grow. If you look at social services in the United States, the first neighborhood social service agency was the church. 
People from that community would go to the church, knock on the door. The pastor probably knew them and knew how best they could help them. Or whether or not they, could, they would have to give the support to somebody else to support them because they couldn't give it directly to that individual. We still have some of that today. And there are still faith-based social service agencies today. But for the most part, by in the 1940s, the New Deal, government took it all over. Here's where I get philosophical. With all the influence we used to have in our communities, from the social service specter and from education to where we are now, is it any wonder that our culture is moving away from the tenants that we hold dear? We used to have an incredible amount of influence within our neighborhoods because we were the place people went to for help. We were the place that children were getting educated. It was an impactful part of the uh, legacy of the United States. And we have pretty much let it go. Not completely, but compared to where it was. If that were the end of the story, I wouldn't be here. But here's what's happening today. Governments had education for a long time. Governments had social services. And quite frankly, they, they're not doing very well, particularly when it comes to children in poverty. And even if they were doing well, here's the, the challenge that I have. You can teach a child the vocabulary they need in preschool in a public school setting that will help them be school ready when they get to kindergarten but you're not teaching them any of the biblical principles that are life success roles. You're not giving them any character building, and you're certainly not giving them the gospel. So how much better for our communities would it be if our churches stepped up and said, we're going to make sure there are preschools in pockets of poverty all over this country where children will get the training that they need to be successful in school, but they'll also get God's word in the process. And they'll be loved by the teachers with the love of Christ. That is what gets me up every day. That's what we are trying to motivate churches to do. And let me give you a quick example. There is a program where churches are trained how to adopt a public school and then given support. It's called Kids Hope. It's out of Michigan. I'm not touting it as one of, we, we've got, I think, five different programs on our website on what churches could pick and choose from. This one, I just have a great example out of that I wanted to share. A couple years ago when I met with them, they had 150 churches that had adopted schools through their program all around the country. They had a waiting list at that time two years ago of 2,500 principals that had called that organization and said, can you please find me a church? The public schools are crying for us to come back in and to be an influence again. And if you as a church have thought about it and haven't done it yet, go to our website. Find out the different programs that you could pick from and pick the one that works best for you and jump in and have an impact on your community school. It's an incredible opportunity. You have retirees that would love to be grandma uh, to a whole bunch of kids in that public school. Trust me. There's a pr biblical principle that says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. My church is very active in an inner city school. And every one of us that have been any part of that are so now invested in that because our heart's there. We want to help the children and the families. That's track number one. And we provide resources. We spotlight programs all around the country that you would be able to see as a member uh, in case they would work for you. That's number one. Track number two, I wish I could go to Governor, it's Bevan, isn't it? I said that right. I wish I could go to Governor Bevan today. He's probably in Lexington with Vice President Pence. But if, if I could see him, I would love to be able to say to him, Governor, you don't have to fund early interventions for children in poverty anymore because the church here in Kentucky has got it covered. But the realization is we're not even in 
anywhere in the country. So Kentucky isn't behind in that. We're all behind in impacting children in poverty from the faith community. And since that's the fact, and we are, I'm seeing it all over the country, the faith community is starting to ramp up to do more and more of this mission field right within their own community. Uh, but we're nowhere near where we need to be yet. So what is happening or what we need to do is we have to partner with government to help these children. Because if government isn't doing it and the church isn't doing it, then we are growing this the individuals within poverty year after year after year. How do we use our members? Much like we do with the fight crime members, fight crime investing kids, the sheriffs, the police chiefs. If we need to influence your senator, by the way, you have a very powerful senator, if you're not aware of it, uh, here in Kentucky. His name is Mitch McConnell. And if Fight Crime Investing Kids wants to try to influence a direction that Mitch McConnell is taking the Senate. Sheriff Sparrow might be one of the people called from Kentucky to go to Washington, D.C. and meet with him. We do the same thing with pastors. And by the way, it didn't cost the sheriff a penny to go to Washington, D.C. Our organization covers all that cost. Again, we're not looking for any money from you we're not looking you for any investment of dollars. We're looking for your voice and your time if you have it, and we will work with you. Here is, uh, l let me give you some quick promises, and that way I can tell you how we do the public policy stuff also. We often write sign-on letters. So if we have a letter that we need to get to your governor or to a chair of one of the critical committees, we send the letter to every one of our members here in Kentucky. And we ask them to take the 30 seconds it would take to read the letter and then just reply yes or no. If you reply yes, you're automatically on the letter. If you reply no, here's my first promise to you. We never use a member's name without their permission. If you don't give us permission, if you, don't, if you say no, we leave you completely off of it. If you don't respond, we leave you completely off of it. But I will warn you, we will try to call you then. Because we want to know whether you would like to be a part of it or not. But if you say no on the phone to us, your name will not go on it. That's my first promise. We never use your name without your permission. Number two thing we might do is we may feel like there is a need for uh, an op-ed to go into the Louisville paper. Uh, maybe it's because there was a, a, an article in the paper that we wanted to argue against or we wanted to applaud. We write the letter and then we will shop it out to the people that are within the district of that particular newspaper to see if anyone is willing to be our signer. So I become your ghostwriter in that sense. I write it for you, you see it, and you tell us, yes, I'll be the author, uh, you can be my ghostwriter, and, and we'll send it in. The reason we do that is they're not going to write, or, or they're not going to print a letter from Tom Pierce with a Washington, D.C. address. But they will write one from a Tom Pierce that lives in LaGrange. So that's number two. Again, you have every right to read through it and say, don't put my name on this one. You know, there's just something about it I'm not comfortable with. And then we'll go to one of our other members and, until we find somebody either that's willing to do it or if, if all of you are saying the same thing that you have a problem with, then we'll rewrite it and, and fix whatever the problem was. If we need you in Frankfurt to meet with a committee or to meet with the governor or to meet with the lieutenant governor or, or whoever it happens to be, uh, we will invite people that are willing to go down. Again, we cover your costs, your mileage, your parking, your meals, whatever it is to be there. And so that's promise number two. Never be a cost to you. Promise number three is if we need you in Washington, D.C., or if we need you in Frankfurt, or if we're going to meet with Mitch McConnell somewhere 
you know, maybe I decided to crash the Pence uh, event today and I, I went down and met with uh, the vice president and with uh, the governor. We staff you. What I mean by that is we don't ask you to go to Frankfurt and then give you a, a talking points document and say, good luck. I'm there with you or one of my staff is there with you. That way, if you get, are asked a question we didn't prepare you for, all you have to do is look back at me or the other staff person, and we'll have the response. And if I don't have the answer, I still have a response. Governor, that's a very good question. I will have the answer to that on your desk by this time tomorrow. And I'll also send you the answer so you got it too. That's what we do. How, have I got five more minutes? Sure. All right. I want to give you, and, and you'll see it in your, in your um, folder. I think you'll see it in your folder. Don't, don't go looking at it yet. <laughs> uh, but I wrote a, uh, an article for Crosswalk. That's Christianity Today's um, web-based magazine. And I titled it, How to Be a Daniel in the Lion's Den of Politics. I want to give you just a very short version of the model that Daniel presents in God's Word that is an incredible roadmap on how to be successful in advocacy with government officials. And I'm only going to give you the, I won't give you the 30 minute sermon. I'll give you the five minute Reader's Digest. Number one, Daniel is, is sent to the palace to be trained for three years along with other young men from all over the empire the Babylonian Empire. And as he's on his way there or before he has picked up whatever it happens to be, he purposes in his heart that he's not going to defile himself with cultural differences between his Jewish faith and the Babylonian culture and faith. His first test is a banquet hall. What they're all ushered into and here before them is what the king eats. Now, the Bible doesn't say, but I'm pretty sure it was a honey-baked ham. <laughs> and he's got a dilemma. He's got to advocate. So what does he do? The very first thing he does is he builds a coalition. He doesn't go and try to fight this fight all by himself. Mm -hmm. He brings three friends that are also Jewish that also have the same issue with him because four voices are stronger than one. That's what shepherding is doing in Kentucky today. We're trying to build our coalition. Mm -hmm. We would love for you to be our Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The second thing that he does is he figures out who is the appropriate person he should advocate to. He doesn't demand to see the king. If he demanded to see the king, he and his head might be in two different places. He figures out who is the best person to advocate with. We do the same thing. We look at who are the chairs of the committees that are going to make the decisions when it comes to public policy. Who are the players within the faith community that we need to have a part of our resources so that churches can be a bigger part of the solution. We go after that. There's the next one I have to extrapolate just a little bit. But it's an incredible sentence that I hold dear for all aspects of my life. And that little sentence is, God caused, God caused the official to show sympathy and favor for Daniel. You know what that says? That says whenever I'm trying to do something for God and I don't have the ability to get it done, he steps in. Isn't that incredible? Hang on to that. I mean, all of you have had experiences just like me where you're, you're so defeated, you don't know where to go. But if you're doing what God wants you to do, God steps in. I love that. The next piece of this is relationship. Daniel doesn't have it yet, so God steps in. But what we try to do as we move into state after state after state is build relationships not only with our members, but our members and ourselves with the officials, with the governor, with the chairman of committees, so that when it's time to advocate with them, we're not brand new to them. They don't, 
they, they don't know who we are. But if they've read something from us, if I've had a chance to meet them in Frankfurt at some event, it helps build the relationship so when we walk in, they already know who we are and what we're all about. So relationship. N next one is, he didn't pick at the dining hall. He didn't stand on a chair pointing down at the food saying, I'm not going to eat this stuff. He didn't walk around the palace seven times and blow a horn seven times. He respectfully makes his request to the official directly above him. That is exactly what we do. We make our request, we give our evidence, we show why we think this is a good idea, and we share it. Now, the official wants to help him, but he's afraid for his own life. You see, back at that time, meat was considered what makes you strong. If you don't eat meat, you're not going to be strong, and they're wanting to eat vegetables and water. This is the only part of this passage I don't like. I love meat. But anyway, the uh, vegetables and water, and, um, and he says, if the king sees you feeble, it's my head. So the last piece of what he does is he suggests a research project. He says, let us eat just vegetables and water for 10 days. If we start to look feeble, you can tell us to stop and we'll eat whatever you want us to. But if we're strong, let us keep it going. I'm pretty sure Daniel didn't win any popularity contest with the other boys than the four. But it was a successful advocating. The reason our roadmap is so good is because we don't just talk about feelings, we talk about research. And we make sure people know that if they do what we suggest they do, if the churches provide uh, a preschool that is designed for kids in poverty, it will work. If government does a preschool, it will work. And your investments are actually a very Republican, a very conservative initiative. Because if we can break the cycle of poverty, we can break the cycle of so many kids in special ed, we can break the cycle of so many kids in the juvenile delinquency system, we can you know, it just goes on how many different ways, if children are successful in education, they can be successful in career, they can be successful in life, and they are not a burden to the government, but an asset. That's who we are. So as I end, in your packet, now you can open it, but you'll, you'll see a, uh, a form at the very beginning. Uh, it has a box where we ask individual who are, consider, or who are willing to sign, to, um, to sign their signature. We need your signature. If we're going to do a sign-on letter, if we're going to do an op-ed, uh, if I had to go send it to everyone after they said yes, they'd be willing to be on it, um, it would take me months to get them all back. But if you give us your signature, and again, we promise we never use it without your permission, if you give us your signature, then we can have something to the governor in 48 hours if we need to. Uh, that is either encouraging him to move forward with something he's already doing or encourage him not to do something that he's talked about doing. So that's why it's important. I would be honored to have each and every one of you become a part of Shepherding. And again, our promises are, as I already shared, uh, it's no cost to you. It is such a light lift. We will not bother you more than two times a month with an email. And one may be an ask for a sign-on letter, then we do ask you to take the 30 seconds to read. The other time will be a spotlight of something that we're doing. And if you don't have time to look at that spotlight, you have my permission to delete it without even looking at it. But I believe we, we do the spotlights because I know somewhere, sometime, you will see something that somebody else is doing in the, in the country that works, that, you th that the spirit kind of pricks you and says, ooh, we could do that here. And what's cool is everyone that we spotlight has agreed to take phone calls from any of our members on how to do it there. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can learn from their mistakes or learn from their successes. So if I could ask, my biggest favor today of you is please join. Uh, it's a light lift.
but an incredible opportunity to learn how to impact children here in Kentucky and throughout our country. If I had time, I'd tell you stories of how we've already impacted uh, families, uh, but I don't. I'm going to turn it back over to the sheriff. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I, I would like to have us all pray together at the end, but um, there we go. Thank you, Tom. Good message. Very good. Um, another spectrum, fight crime. Invest in kids. I've been doing this for 42 years. This is my career. That's what I've done. One of the things I enjoyed most is when I was with the Oldham County Police Department, I taught the D.A.R.E. program. I don't know if many of you all know what that program is. I taught that for six years. And trust me, believe this, to this day. Now, those little fifth graders are now in their 30s, 35, kids, their own kids. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'll tell you that the most gratifying thing in the world is that at a restaurant or in a store and some young lady runs up and hugs me and I said, and my wife's here, you know. <laughs> you remember me? I'm so-and-so. I was in your dare class at Mrs. so-and-so's. Wow, you grew up, you know. I mean, I don't know these children anymore. But I did it for six years and I taught thousands of kids. At, at 11 years old, they looked like 11-year-olds. At 35 years old, they don't look the same, okay? <laughs> but to this day, they know who I am, and they still remember me. And for those now adults, run up and hug me, and I have no idea who they are until they tell me. And say, Sheriff Sparrow, that was the best thing we've ever done in our life. To this day, I've never done drugs. Now, don't get me wrong. There's plenty that have. But for those that don't and didn't and still don't, that is the most gratifying thing for me to say, I made a difference. I made one heck of a difference with these children's lives. And that's why when I got into the, the sheriff's office and learned about fight crime, invest in kids, I said, that's me. I'm, I'm all in. And to this day, I'm still preaching the word to, let's fight crime, guys. Let's invest in our children. They are your future. That's where it's at. You know, when I was a young kid, I was a, can't say it, but I was probably on the wrong path. And it was just one day it snapped, and I said, I'm going to be a policeman when I was 12 years old. Because a police officer, I was at a scene of an accident, and I asked him, what was going on? What's going on? He didn't have to talk to me, but he took the time to stop and talk to me and explain to me what happened. And from that second right there, I said, I know what I'm going to do when I grow up. I'm nosy. I want to know what's going on. So that's what changed my life. Someone took time to talk to a young 11-year-old kid. And that's why I firmly believe that folks can talk to young kids, even as young as four or five, and make a big difference in their lives. So... Uh, Let's talk about the benefits of high quality early education, care programs every day, and the research from fight crime, invest in kids, confirms it. Law enforcement officers spend every day tracking down and arresting dangerous criminals. We know there is no substitute to, touch, to tough policing, but we also know that to win the fight against crime, America's commitment to putting criminals in jail must be matched. <clears throat> now, like Tom said earlier, I have been called to Washington, and it didn't cost a penny for the taxpayers here in Oldham County. Fight crime, investing kids, picked up the bill, the air flight, the hotel, the meals, and everything. And I've been called to go, and I've spoken with Senator McConnell at the uh, Capitol and Senator Orrin Hatch, and it was a program that Fight Crime, Investing Kids was trying to were trying to get a uh, bill passed for funding for underprivileged families because face it without good programs a lot of your children are going to grow up to be criminals and I'm not saying every child but underprivileged families 
and I think somewhere in here, I don't even know where it, I'm not going to look for it, it says 50% of those children have a fighting chance of making it out of poverty. So we were up there to Washington, and I was speaking with the, uh, the, two, the, the two senators, and after I got through talking with them, they agreed that this needed to be funded, so they voted on it, and it did pass to get the funding for the, uh, the, fund, the, the program that the Fight Crime Invested Kids were uh, seeking to, to obtain. And then today, they've asked if I would host this. Graciously, yes, I will. Like I say, I will do anything I can for our children, and I hope, I hope you all feel the same, I, and I know you do. Deep in your heart, you know you do anything in the world for a child, and especially if one that was underprivileged and you saw that it, he or she needed some help. I know in your heart <laughs> you're not going to say no or turn that child down. So uh, when I went to D.C., I joined a couple of prosecutors, Brody Kiso and Jared Eldridge from Utah, and the Jefferson County, Kentucky Commonwealth Attorney Tom Wine. And the four of us were sent there to discuss this issue with the senators. And like I said, we, uh, we, I guess we were pretty much pretty convincing. And we sold the senators on it. And they went back and uh, got this bill passed. So we were very happy about that. Uh, now, I guess the last thing I want to discuss here is why we're here today. We're asking all the pastors to join the shepherding, the next generation, to do similar activities to help with prevention. Please avoid, <clears throat> well, early childhood care and education helps children succeed in school and in life. The ABCs of crime prevention start with kids learning their ABCs. Additionally, preschool participants are more likely to complete high school, and the research shows that education and economic prosperity uh, is linked so guys uh, Tom you had your presentation you've heard my spiel what I believe in and uh, we got 10 more minutes so we are going to open this up for discussion and Tom will stick around and answer any questions you have I will stick around and answer any questions you have and after that I know he wanted to close a prayer, but after that, we have a room over across the hall with some refreshments and coffee, orange juice, uh, I guess whatever else you brought. Yep. Okay, good. So if you would, if you have questions, please, please, let's hear your hand. Let's see your hand. You got the answer. Can you answer with the question? Yes. Okay. Repeat right. the question. Yeah. So. Questions, anyone, please. Tom, you said you're not looking for money, which is great, uh, but who does fund Shepherding the Next Generation? All right, the question is, who does fund Shepherding the Next Generation? You're going to be surprised by some of the, uh, the names, um, but what they have found is that most of the public policy makers in most of the communities, uh, the churches are still a, a vibrant part of uh, either the lives of the legislators or the lives within the communities. So uh, we have several foundations that uh, help us. One is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, we have uh, a United Way that uh, is supporting what we do. We have uh, the RWJ, our Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the baby powder people, uh, really like what what we're able to do. And so, as of now, the majority of our givers are more in that foundation uh, piece, but it's been more than sufficient to give us what we need to do to get the job done. Oh, by the way, if, as you're filling it out today, um, I forgot to mention that Chief Sparrow, Chief, Sheriff Sparrow, uh, has offered a get out of jail free card to anyone that turns one in. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm you in, got those printed up? I'm in jail after all, I guess. But um, the, the one other thing I, I did mean to mention that I didn't, and I, I just want to get this out to help anyone that may be having a concern. This is a membership of pastors and ministry leaders. All of you qualify. It is not a membership of your churches. <clears throat> I, and I didn't make that clear earlier, and I thought I should. 
Uh, so you're not signing your church up for anything. You're signing yourself to be a member of Shepherding. Yeah, the, the answer is, I, I got to answer, the, the question was, um, with, with, secular, with secular funding, uh, does that limit anything that shepherding does as, uh, from the spiritual perspective? And the answer is almost as complicated as you're, you're getting that question out. First of all, uh, we are partners fight crime, invest in kids, and shepherding, we're under the same umbrella. So there are secular organizations that Bill and Melinda Gates are funding within that umbrella, <coughs> along with this faith-based group. When we advocate for government spending, we know that it's got to be semi-limited what the spending is. We don't accept government money, so it doesn't limit what I do or what I say. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates understand that, you know, we are who we are and we are going to argue for what we think is good and they have no problem with that. They, they've actually come on board to say, we know the faith community has got to be engaged in these initiatives for children or we're not going to be as successful as we could. Um, as it comes to public policy, we've had both sides. We, we, we helped. Mississippi fund early learning for kids in poverty for the first time in the state's history. But because it was the Bible Belt and because it was Mississippi, we were able to also get church preschools as a possibility for that funding because it was the parent's choice where their children got preschool. Was it the public school or was it within the church? And what we did with the churches that wanted to be a part of that is we helped them make sure their program was research-wise going to be successful. Let me explain that just for one second. A preschool for any of your children or grandchildren could be at any public school and would be very successful. A preschool for kids in poverty has to have a parent modeling piece connected to it or it will not be as successful. Because if we're not teaching the parents how to help their children back at home, uh, they're not going to get any help from, from home, where we all did. I mean, you know, my, cho my, my kids almost read the books to me by second, second age two, not because they could read. We would read so much to them, they'd memorize the book, you know. And, and that's, um, you know, the parents in poverty don't know those things quite as much. But... I hope I answered your question. Um, I almost got pol political on you there, but uh, the goal was, you know, shepherding is all about the evangelical faith community impacting these children. 
Uh, and if we can do it through the church, we can do it with the gospel and everything. And our funders understand that and are good with it. Let me also point out something I failed to mention to you earlier. This is a very large organization, Fight Crime, Invest in Kids. At our National Sheriff's Conference, we just had it in Reno two weeks ago. But it's somewhere different every year, it doesn't matter. But Fight Crime Invest Kids always has a booth there. They're always there. And now there's over 3,000 sheriffs in the United States. There's over 5,500 members of this organization. It includes police chiefs, sheriffs, prosecutors, uh, you know, attorneys, prosecutors. Uh, it's just a multitude of different occupations. It's a very, very large organization. So it's, uh, it's a pretty serious thing. You know, and a lot of folks take heart in this. So I just wanted to point out to you how large it was and how many members there are in this fight crime investing kids. So, and like Tom said, they'll fly you out to do different programs. They ask us to host different programs and uh, it's all on them. Uh, it doesn't cost us a penny. I want to throw that in. Yes, sir. Or right, ma'am. Um, so just to kind of piggyback off of her, so who actually writes the curriculum? And is the curriculum, like, would you use the same that you use in Mississippi? Does that, would that be, like, kind of in the same state? Or how would that work? We, uh, we don't write curriculum, uh, but we know people that do. And, and so we, that's, again, where that linking of organizations I talked about, that's where that happens. Uh, even in the adopt a school programs across the country, uh, we know of five. I mean, Tony Evans has one out of Dallas, uh, Kids Hope out of Michigan, uh, Team Reed out of Memphis, Tennessee, uh, and there are two or three others that that you know each are a little different, but all of them have their own the the materials needed to be able to do it. Well, all of those are spiritual component pieces, um, and, and yes, yeah, especially in the preschool, uh, some of the uh, Christian school literatures or, or um, curriculum providers are now working into the preschool ages, finally. And do, are, are those, um, are they actually in school buildings, or are those mostly in churches? Well, those are mostly in churches, or in the... Um, there's an incredible school just south of you a little ways in Franklin, Tennessee, um, that has 50% uh, children in poverty, not only in the preschool, but they go through eighth grade. In their preschool, it's 50% poverty, 50% pain, and it's an incredible what, what they're doing. Uh, I'll have to look it up. It's not on the top of my head. But... Um, it was built just for that idea that, that we needed a place where, and what's, what's so exciting about it is kids in, kids in poverty are inviting kids of means to their houses for birthday parties and they're going back and forth and the cultural barriers are going away um, between the, the people that attend the school. And at eighth grade, the top high schools in that area are bidding for these kids. They want them. Could I pray to close us? And again, I, if you've filled out the form, we would love to have it uh, today and uh, make you a part of our membership. And uh, if, you, if you need a little time, we understand, but don't take too much. I've learned that the, it ends up at the bottom of the pile and never seen again. Um, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. But I, I want to pray a blessing over your ministries uh, and yours uh, as we end. Father, again, we want to pray for the law enforcement of this community. Put a hedge of protection around them. Bless them in their work. Give them extraordinary wisdom in how to handle each circumstance they face. May the citizens of this community feel their support and their love and feel protected by them and respond accordingly to that. 
Lord, for the churches within this community. I pray for each and every one of them. May the pastors be powerful in their message of you. May they grow in extraordinary ways because of their commitment to you. And may they sense your presence in their walk today. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much.